Here's a summary of the entire physics paper 2 spec. You asked for it, so I made it. This is my last post for the year and I hope you found the videos, website and lives all useful. Well done for getting through it all and I can't wait to hear how you've done it. A scalar is a quantity which has magnitude but no direction, so this includes all of these things, whereas a vector has magnitude and direction. And here are some examples of these. Forces are an example of a vector and they can be divided into two groups. Contact forces where objects need to be in physical contact with each other to occur and non-contact forces that don't need to be in contact to occur. Contact forces include tension which you have on strings and ropes, air resistance or drag where an object travels through the air or a fluid, friction which is a force that resists motion when two surfaces are in contact with each other and move past each other, and the normal contact force which is a force that acts between two objects that are in contact with each other. Non-contact forces include electrostatic force which acts between charged particles, magnetic force which acts between magnets and gravitational force which is also known as weight. Weight is the force that acts on an object with mass due to gravity. It depends on the gravitational field strength of the planet that it's on and can be worked out with this equation. This shows that the weight and mass of an object is directly proportional. That just means if you double the mass of an object, you also double its weight. Weight always appears to act at a single point on an object known as the object's center of mass. The forces on an object can always be shown with a free body diagram where each arrow represents a force and the bigger the arrow, the bigger the force. Resultant force just means the overall force acting on an object and if the forces on the object go in the same direction, you add them to get the resultant force. If they go in the opposite direction, you subtract them. Sometimes the forces are at right angles to each other and in this scenario, to find the resultant force, you need to use a scale drawing. Just draw the arrows tip to toe where one arrow leads onto the other and measure the length of the diagonal of the forces. Then use the scale to convert the length into a force. This is the magnitude of the force and to find the direction, you can just use a protractor to find the angle. Sometimes you can be given a diagonal force and asked to work out the horizontal and vertical component of it. For this you use a scale drawing again and measure the horizontal distance of the force to find the horizontal component and the vertical distance to find the vertical component. Again you need to use the scale to convert the lengths into forces. Work is done on an object when a force is applied to it and it moves a particular distance. You can calculate it using this equation. When work is done on an object, energy is transferred from one store to another. If you apply two or more forces to an object, it can sometimes cause deformation, which is when it changes shape. Objects can be stretched, compressed and bent. Deformation can be elastic where it returns to its original shape and size after you remove the forces and inelastic where it doesn't. In elastic deformation, the work done to deform the object is all converted into elastic potential energy which is stored in the object. Whereas in inelastic deformation, the work done is wasted as heat to the surroundings. You can work out the elastic potential energy stored using this equation. Hooke's law tells you that when you deform an elastic object, the force of the object is directly proportional to the extension of it. And this is shown by this equation. When you plot a graph of force against the extension, you'll see that the graph is initially straight and goes through the origin. This shows you that Hooke's law is obeyed. Eventually, it reaches a point called the limit of proportionality where the graph starts to curve and Hooke's law is no longer obeyed. You can work out the spring constant of an object by finding the gradient of the straight part of the line. Spring constant just tells you how easy it is to stretch the object. Next up, we have forces in motion where distance is defined as how far an object moves and it's a scalar quantity that doesn't depend on direction, whereas displacement is the overall distance and direction an object moves from its starting position and it's a vector version of distance. Similarly, speed is a scalar quantity that tells you how fast an object moves, whereas velocity is the vector version of speed, and it's the speed of an object in a given direction. The equation for speed is this, and here are some typical speeds you need to be aware of. You can represent the motion of an object using a distance time graph where the steeper the line is, the faster the object is moving. So a flat horizontal line means the object isn't moving, any other straight line means it's traveling at a constant speed, and a curved line means it's accelerating or decelerating, which means it's speeding up or slowing down. To find the speed of the object at any point, you need to find the gradient of the line. So if it's on a curved part of the line, you need to draw a tangent and find the gradient of the tangent. On a velocity time graph, on the other hand, the steeper the line is, the greater the acceleration of the object. Acceleration is given by this equation and can also be worked out using this equation. In a velocity time graph, a flat horizontal line represents the object traveling at a constant speed, whereas any other straight line means it's accelerating or decelerating at a constant rate. And if you have a curved line, the acceleration or deceleration is changing. You can also work out the distance traveled by the object by working out the area under the graph. Terminal velocity occurs when an object falls through a liquid or gas due to the force of gravity. 
So when a person falls, initially there are two forces acting on them. Weight due to gravity, which stays the same always, and drag or air resistance, which increases the further the person falls. This causes their speed to increase, which means they are accelerating. As the person falls, the drag keeps increasing until it becomes equal to weight. And at this point, the speed becomes constant and there's no acceleration. This means the person has reached their maximum speed, which is known as the terminal velocity. Next up, we have Newton's three laws of motion, where the first law states that if the forces on an object are balanced and there is no resultant force acting on the object, it's either stationary or traveling at a constant speed. The second law is the opposite of this, so if the forces are unbalanced and there is a resultant force on the object, the object accelerates. You can work out the acceleration using this equation, and it shows that force and acceleration are directly proportional. Newton's third law states that when two objects interact, they exert forces on each other which are equal and opposite. So if a person pushes against a wall with a force of 50 newtons, the wall will exert a force back on the person that's also 50 newtons, but in the opposite direction. Inertia is an object's tendency to keep doing what it's doing. And inertial mass is a measure of how difficult it is to change the velocity of an object. So if you compare a bowling ball and a basketball, the bowling ball has a greater inertial mass as it's more difficult to speed it up or slow it down. Inertial mass is defined as the ratio of force over acceleration. Next up, we have stopping distance, which is used when a driver sees a hazard on the road and needs to apply the brakes to stop the car as fast as they can. The distance the car travels from the moment they press the brakes to the moment they stop is known as the stopping distance. Stopping distance is a sum of the thinking distance and braking distance, where thinking distance is the distance the car travels during the driver's reaction time, and the braking distance is the distance the car travels during the car's braking force. Thinking distance is affected by alcohol or drug intake, tiredness and distractions, whereas braking distance is affected by road or vehicle conditions. The speed of the car affect both thinking and braking distance. When the brakes are applied on a car, work is done by the frictional forces of the car and kinetic energy is converted mechanically to the thermal energy of the brakes. This causes the temperature of the brakes to increase and it slows down the car. Cars and any other object that moves has momentum and it can be calculated using the following equation. Momentum is always conserved, which means that the total momentum before any collision is always equal to the total momentum after a collision. Topic 6 is all about waves which transfer energy from one place to another without transferring matter. And they do this by causing the particles in the substance it travels through to vibrate or oscillate. There are two types of waves that exist. Transverse waves where the oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer and longitudinal waves where the oscillations are parallel to the direction of energy transfer. Examples of transverse waves are water waves and electromagnetic waves and examples of longitudinal waves are sound waves. In transverse waves, the top of the wave is called the peak and the bottom is called the trough. The amplitude is the maximum displacement from the rest position, which is basically the center of the wave, and the wavelength is the distance between two adjacent peaks or troughs. In longitudinal waves, you can have areas of compressions where the particles are close together, and rarefactions where the particles are further apart. The wavelength in a longitudinal wave is the distance between two adjacent compressions. Other properties you need to know about waves are frequency, which is the number of waves passing a point per second, and time period or period, which is the time it takes for one complete wave to pass a point. There are two equations that link these definitions, which are this and this. When a wave reaches a boundary between two materials, it can do one of three things. Reflection, where it bounces off the material. Absorption, where its energy is transferred to the material. And transmission, where it just passes straight through the material. During transmission, refraction can occur. This is where the wave enters a new medium and its speed changes, which causes its direction to change too. When a wave goes from a less dense material to a more dense material, it bends towards the normal. A normal is just a line that's perpendicular to the surface. When it travels from an area of high to low density, it bends away from the normal. Electromagnetic waves are examples of transverse waves that all travel at the same speed in a vacuum, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. There are seven electromagnetic waves and they all form a continuous spectrum made up of radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, visible light, which include all seven colors of the rainbow, which are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, ultraviolet waves, X-rays, and gamma rays. As you go from radio to gamma in the spectrum, the wavelength decreases and the frequency increases. Radio waves are used in wireless communication where they're created using a transmitter with alternating current, which causes electrons to oscillate and generate radio waves. These radio waves have the same frequency as the alternating current. 
These radio waves then travel long distances and reach a receiver which absorbs them and causes electrons to vibrate and create an alternating current again. Microwaves are used in satellite communication as they can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere with little interference. They're also used in cooking as they cause the water in food to vibrate which heats up the rest of the food. Infrared radiation is used in electric heaters and in infrared cameras where the hotter something is the brighter it appears and visible light is used in fiber optic communication which transfers a large amount of data over long distances with very little loss of signal. Ultraviolet radiation is used in tanning beds and energy efficient lamps where it's converted into visible light and x-rays and gamma rays are both used for medical imaging where gamma rays are also used for cancer treatment. Electromagnetic waves can cause changes in atoms and nuclei where they move electrons to a higher energy level when the electron absorbs electromagnetic radiation. When they emit electromagnetic radiation, they move down to a lower energy level. The higher frequency electromagnetic waves like ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays can all be hazardous to humans. Ultraviolet rays can cause skin to age prematurely and increases the risk of skin cancer, whereas X-rays and gamma rays are both examples of ionizing radiation. These can cause DNA damage and lead to increased risk of cancer. The impact these waves have on the body depends on the type of radiation and the dose the body is exposed to, and this is measured in sieverts. The final topic is magnetism where two opposite poles cause attraction and two like poles cause repulsion. These magnets are made up of magnetic materials which can either be iron, steel, nickel or cobalt. A magnetic field is a region of space where a magnet, a magnetic material or a current carrying wire experiences a force. They can be represented by field lines with arrows. When the field lines are far apart, the field is weak and when the field lines are close together, they're strong. So if you look at the magnetic field of a bar magnet, you can see the field is the strongest at the poles as this is where the field lines are the closest. Magnetic fields are invisible but you can observe them using a compass near a magnet and plotting points in the direction that it points. You then move the magnet to the next point and keep repeating this and when you join all the dots together, you'll get a field line. Magnets can either be permanent or induced. A permanent magnet is one that produces its own magnetic field, whereas an induced magnet is a magnetic material that becomes magnetized when it gets close to the field of a permanent magnet. They form opposite poles and get attracted to the permanent magnet. When a current flows through a wire, a magnetic field is also produced, but the shape of this is made of concentric circles. You can work out the direction of the field by using the right hand grip rule where you hold your right hand like a thumbs up and the thumb points in the direction of the current and the direction your fingers point tells you the direction of the field. You can increase the strength of the field of a current carrying wire by increasing the current in it or coiling the wire up into a solenoid. The field of a solenoid looks just like a bar magnet on the outside but it's made up of straight lines in the inside which show that there's a uniform field. This is where the strength of the field is the same everywhere. You can add an iron core to increase the strength of the solenoid to turn it into an electromagnet. This is a magnet that can be turned on and off and if you have no current flowing through it, it will not be magnetized but if you do have current flowing through it, it will be magnetized. Now because current carrying wires produce their own magnetic fields, they can interact with another magnetic field and cause a force. This can cause the wire to move and it's called the motor effect. You can calculate the magnitude of the force produced by the motor effect by using this equation. To find the direction of the force produced, you can use Fleming's left hand rule where you hold your left hand out like this and the first finger represents the direction of the magnetic field, the second finger is the direction of the current and the thumb points in the direction of the force. So in this example, if you line up the field with your first finger and the current with your second finger, the thumb will tell you the direction of the force and this in this case would be upwards, meaning the wire would move upwards. This concept allows electric motors to work where a coil of wire is placed within a magnetic field. And because each side of the coil has current flowing in opposite directions, they experience forces in opposite directions. This starts the rotation of the motor. The split ring commutator reverses the current every half turn, meaning the direction of the forces reverses every half turn, and this allows the motor to keep turning. 